Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. I love how every angle of this only traps angry Lynn tighter in his own misdeeds. Apprentice engineer pisses off the crew, gets left behind 250 miles from home. Some years ago, I got a gig working a weekend music festival. Fairly simple, too. Ten bands per day and all pretty standard rock and roll fare. Boss man puts four of us out on the gig, me, dreadful Boris, big Chris, and Hammer. He also said we'd be taking out an apprentice, a young lad who was the son of a local promoter. Oh, always nice to have an extra pair of hands, and it's good to help train the next generation. After all, that's how we learned in the past. As it turned out, this lad was about as much use as an aqualung to a trout. He had an entitled attitude the size of a mid-ranged African country. He was a really good sound engineer already, and that he could probably show us a few tricks. Oh, really? We get to the venue and get busy unloading the truck. We've got a 16-tonner stuffed to the gills with two sound desks and about 16 kilowatts of sound gear for front of the house and about 6 kilowatts of monitors. As you might imagine, this is pretty heavy stuff, and it takes all of us to safely unload it and get it stacked up in place. Except that after unloading the first amp rack, all on wheels, but still around 80 kilos, the entitled brat snottily announces that I'm a sound engineer, not a humper, and promptly strolls off. Uh, okay. Well, we didn't really need him gumming up the works. We're all well used to slinging boxes around, so about an hour later, we've got the rig stacked up and strapped down, run out to the multi-core to the FOH desk, and are ready to start cabling up and tying power into the on-site generator. Out of nowhere, the spotty oik emerges from whatever hole he buried himself in and asks what he can do. I say, I'm going to plug up front of house speakers. Perhaps you could help Hammer cable up the speakers. Yeah, I don't take orders from girlies. Quick side note here, Hammer was 5'9", drop-dead gorgeous, and hard as nails, hence her nickname. She was also a damn fine FOH engineer and a bloody good mate. Boris, Chris, and I collectively groaned inwardly and winced in anticipation of a full 16-inch broadside from Hammer. Seriously, folks, do not F with her unless you want the family jewels dangling from the nearest tree. Instead, she smiles sweetly, never a good sign and says, well, I'm sure you'll learn something useful. I then go off to play with the cables FOH while Boris and Chris busy themselves with the monitors. A while later, I'm back on stage. Spotty Oik has wandered off again. Hammer has this resigned look on her face. What happened, I ask? Turns out that despite cables and connector ports being well labeled, the Oik had managed to make a complete pig's ear of plugging up the amp racks. Trust me, it's very hard to make this kind of mistake. I found the wake some moments later and told him that it was not the proper way of doing things and that if he wasn't sure what to do, he should always ask one of us beforehand. What then came out of his mouth absolutely floored me. I don't need to know all that crap. I'm a sound engineer. What? Hammer, who was standing a few feet away, snorted derisively and rolled her eyes heavenwards. It took me a few seconds to process this particular nugget of stupid, well, you have to know how all this works. It's part and parcel of the job. As you're here to learn, I suggest you pay attention. Well, you're just a bunch of roadies. What do you know? Upon delivering this charming bon mot, he ambles off, again, leaving me to retrieve my jaw from the deck and Hammer barely able to restrain a fit of laughter that would have incapacitated a rhino. At a guess, this idiot thought he was going to be white-gloving front of house for the whole gig. An hour or so later, we're all set up. Now we have a fair idea of the acts and how they're going to be performing. In situations like this, you rarely get the opportunity of a full-blown sound check, so you have to rely on experience to set the desk up from the cold. Luckily, we got the first act on stage a half hour before the kickoff, so I could quickly get a rough sense of the overall setup. A bit of exposition. It's convenient to reuse channels across acts, so I generally keep the first 20 or so channels for drums, bass, and guitars, and the last half dozen or so channels for vocals. If a band comes in with anything else, percussion, brass, Tibetan nose flutes, etc., we whack them on channels in the middle. Keeps things nice and simple and consistent across the board, and becomes important in a moment. The working procedure in show is also simple. Dreadful Boris and Big Chris run the monitor desk, and Hammer and I run front of house. 
We'll do two acts each before handing over to the other. Saves wear and tear on the ears, and when we're not running the desk, we'll handle setting up the stage for each act and troubleshooting when necessary, as well as doing runs for food and coffee in between. We also tasked the spotty oik with help with the stage setups, which rapidly proved problematic. We finished the first act and aimed to do the turnover within 15 minutes. Generally, the incoming act will tell us their mic requirements and we'll write up a mic plot, which then gets sent up to the front of house desk. Up comes spotty oik with the mic plot and he goes back to help with stage setup. As I'm checking each mic, I notice that I cannot hear the vocal channels. No sooner had I spotted this than Dreadful Boris comes on the intercom and asks if I can hear the vocal channels. He can't hear them either. He then goes off to check the stage box where the mics are plugged in. From all the way out front, I hear him shout, F me! Seconds later, he's back on the cans. Do you know what that effing idiot has done? Only repatched all the vocal channels so that all the plugs on the stage box are lined up neatly one after the other. His words. Ye gods. Boris is rapidly repatching the mics, and we're good to go again. A few hours later, I'm starting my second shift out front. I won't bore you with my experiences of riding herd on Spotty Oik on stage shift, which, shall we say, was interesting. Currently on stage is a rather nice jazz septet. I love doing jazz. Give me a nice 20-piece big band and I'm a happy bunny. Up strolls he who shall not be mentioned and asks, When can I have a go at mixing? I'm really good, you know. Seeing as how he's here to learn, I tell him he can take the next act under my supervision. This happened to be an acoustic duo. Two guitars and two vocals. Even the most tyro engineer should be able to handle something so simple, right? Wrong. I've already set what I regarded as a sensible bass line on the faders for him to work with, First thing he does is reach for the master faders and cranks in another 15 decibels. No! Immediately the rig teeters on the edge of feedback and I rapidly pull the mains back. Look and listen. Balance out the two vocals, then the guitars, leave the mains alone. He then starts making wildly inappropriate changes to the channel's EQ. Again, the rig starts to squeak. Okay, enough. I shove him out of the way and bring it back under control. I won't fatigue you further with the endless catalog of foul-ups and attitude that he managed to affect over the rest of the weekend. Suffice to say that despite the best efforts of myself and Hammer to try and teach this guy, they all went for naught. Couple this with the constant drip, drip, drip of snide commentary about he was really a better engineer than the rest of us, and by the end of the weekend, we're all pretty pissed off. Come the end of the event, and now comes the fun part of striking the rig and loading out. I'm being sarcastic about the fun part, by the way. Two solid days and we're all knackered, and the last thing we want to be doing is the get out. But of course it has to be done. It's always an all-hands-on-deck situation, except the spotty oik has once again vanished into the woodwork. Two back-breaking hours later and we're all done. Trucks loaded to go home. So where's spotty oik? Nowhere. We give it a good 15 minutes, but no joy. We then decide to go look for him, so we spend another 20 minutes trolling around the site trying to find him. Again, he's done a disappearing act. We get back to the truck, it's now close to 3 a.m., and almost simultaneously we say F him. We climb back on board and drive the 250 miles back to the warehouse to unload. Next afternoon, boss man calls me to find out why we left Spotty Oik behind. I gave him the cliff notes and was then told that the Oik had to call his dad at 3 in the morning to come and get him a 500-mile round trip. He then said, I never liked that promoter anyway. He was always late paying the bill on previous gigs. Next time he calls wanting a rig and crew, I think I'll tell him to F off. Our last story. How I get my money back from a scammer when police refuse to help. This is not my story. It was posted on a web board in my native language, but I think it'd fit here. OP has a real estate business often buy a land or an old house, then improve it and sell it. Occasionally, she leases a place, improves it, then subleases it. She found an old shabby house at a great location online so she could contact the agent and offer to buy it, but the agent said the owner only wanted to lease it. So they agreed to make a lease contract that had to be renewed every three years and negotiated a date to sign it. However, OP has to go abroad for some time before they'll be able to meet and sign a contract. So agent asks for a deposit for about $1,800, and OP agrees. One day after our deposit is transferred, the agent deletes all her posts on the website, 
blocks OP's number and left the chat in line, similar to WhatsApp. OP collects all chat logs and transfers paper, then goes to police. They said they cannot do anything since it's a civil case despite OP's protest that this is fraud, hence a criminal case. Without police's paper, OP cannot go to the bank and has that agent's account suspended. Instead, she consults a law firm, which also has a private investigation service. For about $75, the investigator gave OP the agent's real phone number, legal address, her license plate, the company name, and address where she works, list of her relatives, and their phone numbers, also their address. And the lawyer at the firm wrote a letter stating that OP is going to sue for criminal case and send it to her legal address. OP then spent another $150 to hire an investigator to find out where she actually lived and keep an eye on her for information such as who she lives with and her daily routine. After finding out that she only lived on her own, OP went to her house to confront her and ask her for the money back. She said she doesn't have it now and will transfer it back later. OP proceeds to tell her that in that case, she wants her agent to contact her agent's boss to guarantee that OP will get her money back. She refuses to let anyone at the company know about this. Instead, she transfers $900 back to OP via mobile phone. At that moment, she said she will transfer the rest at the end of the month. OP said that is unacceptable, that she'll contact her parents, then shows the info she has on her. The agent was beyond shocked and tells OP that her parents had mentioned a letter from a law firm, but they didn't open it. The agent then began to weep and cry and beg for mercy and promise for the money at the end of the month. OP agrees, then said she changed her number and asked for her agent's phone so OP could save her number into her agent's phone. When the agent hands OP the phone, it was an iPhone, OP said she will keep it and only give it back when she gets the money at the end of the month. Also, the remaining balance is not $900 but $1,125 for she has to hire a private investigator to get to her. However, she gives her back her SIM card. OP said that if she goes to the police about the phone or she does not receive the money, she'll contact her company and her parents and take her to criminal court. At the end of the month, OP received the money but contacted her company anyway to make sure she could not find a job in real estate anymore. The agent calls OP and berates her for her dishonesty as she did everything she was told to do, but OP still contacted the company. OP said to her that honesty is not for a thief. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.